Daniel's computer. Here we go. All right, so good evening, everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Ann Fister. I'm Associate Professor of Anthropology here at the University of North Florida, and I'm also Director of the Digital Humanities Institute, or DHI. The DHI promotes collaboration on interdisciplinary projects that combine the use of technology with materials and methodologies from the humanities, fine arts, and social sciences. The DHI is composed of faculty and students across UNF. It's an intercollegial institute bringing student and faculty interests and expertise, and expertise together through a variety of venues, including today's discussion and several community connections, um, one of the emphases of this presentation tonight. So um, just a little bit of background information. I set a few goals for my two-year term as DHI director. And as an anthropologist, these include bringing in more social science projects and perspectives and broadening the focus of digital to include technology more generally. After all, as we know, in the field of anthropology, tech near, tech, technology is nearly synonymous with human culture and ingenuity and is studied as a crucial component of our evolution as a species. In other words, technology is something that makes us very uniquely human. I'm also interested in underscoring the importance of public scholarship, which is the inspiration for this roundtable series that we'll take part in today. So today's roundtable, Cool Anthropology, How to Engage the Public with Academic Research, is the first, is, uh, no, it's not the first, it's the third in a series of discussions aimed at better understanding the importance of public scholarship. So um, the, the editors of a book with the same title are Christina Baines and Victoria Costa, who I will introduce now. Christina Baines is a sociocultural anthropologist with an applied medical and environmental focus. Her research interests include indigenous ecologies, health and heritage in the context of global change, in addition to publicly engaged research and dissemination practices. She's Associate Professor of Anthropology at the City University of New York, Gutman Community College, affiliated faculty at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, Department of Community Health and Social Sciences, and the co-founder and director of anthropology for Cool Anthropology. Victoria Costa is a creative innovator who leverages her skills in designing thinking, program management, technology, and collective action to build community around projects supporting more just societies. Her interests include social permaculture, rethinking education and breaking down the walls of academia to provide wide access to research ideas. She's co-founder, principal strategist, and director of COOL at COOL Anthropology and an active community organizer. So I'll turn the uh, session over to these two um, and take it away. Friends, thanks. Thanks so much, Anne, for the invitation um, and the kind introduction. Um, what we're going to do is just briefly share a little bit about um, who and what cool anthropology is and how the volume kind of came together. And then we're going to introduce our wonderful colleagues who are here and begin the round table discussion. Well, I guess that, that's on me. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about cool anthropology and our the genesis of our organization. So in 2004, I went to my first American Anthropological Association meeting with Christina. Um, <laughs> And uh, we stumbled into a session called Making Anthropology Cool. And like this round table here, there were very few attendees and a lot of excitement for the work and a lot of vision for the future of the discipline. And it planted a seed in our hearts and minds that, that lived for many years. It wasn't until 2011 that we started the Cool Anthropology website. And we had had a lot of discussions around why journalists and other storytellers were calling economists and psychologists um, and not anthropologists and ethnographers who have community relationships and have spent a good a great deal of time in communities um, getting information getting more trustable information so we thought to rectify that with a with a, a series of articles called ask the anthropologist and we opened it up to the to the internet community to 
to ask anthropologists any questions they wanted. And then we would connect them with relevant anthropologists in uh, the specific d disciplines of uh, medical anthropology or environmental anthropology and, and all of the other subsections um, to answer the questions appropriately. So that got us rolling. Um, and at the same time, Christina was finishing her PhD and the AAA, the American Anthropological Association, uh, was starting a, a new series at their meetings called InnoVents, which eventually became Installations. And we wanted to be a part of that. We thought it was really cool. At the time, I was uh, I owned a small web and print marketing company, and I was working a lot with artists and musicians and nonprofits to tell their stories. I was sponsoring events at Art Basel Miami. And we had this vision of uh, taking her research framework and turning it into a really cool art installation and kicking it, kicking it off at the AAA meetings. So her work um, deals with a lot with embodiment. And we, our first project, we had a, an embodiment component. So we invited all these different sorts of people. We invited artists using different modalities. We invited anthropologists with different research programs all around the world um, and different community members to, to, ask, to answer the same question what is embodied ecological heritage? And they all answered it through their research frameworks, through their uh, different modes, their artistic modes, and through their experience in community. Um, we thought that was really cool putting that all together, but we really wanted people to, to talk about it when they left. And we thought that if they only read something or only saw something or only watched something, that they were less likely to go talk about it when they left the room as if they did something. So we actually had them grind corn uh, and make this drink called Sa, which is uh, from the community where Christina did her field work. And they were walking around our art gallery, our makeshift pop-up art gallery, with cups of this corn drink as if it was wine. And we thought that if they were doing that, they might go actually talk about it. And they might go talk about embodiment. And they might go talk about ecological heritage with the people that they went home to with their friends. So, and our perspective is that if we're going to change the culture, we need to uh, change what people talk about, change what people think about first. We're not going to change how they behave, but we might be able to influence how they think and what they discuss. So that really became a, a huge impetus for our work and a very common thread through all of our different um, projects. Embodiment became a, a big theme for us. Um, so since then, we've done many different pop-up installations. Uh, we we really like to think about experiential learning and using the body. Um, and we think about scaling those things and, and how they might live with us not having to be there, That's, which is really important. When we're doing a pop-up installation, we're the docents, we're the experts, and we have to be there to explain things. So we really started conceptualizing our projects to live without us there and scaling them through digital companions, through curriculum guides. And now we're thinking about how to get them into schools uh, and it's really exciting. Over the last few years, we've been evangelizing this work um, and evangelizing public scholarship and getting information out of the academy into the hands of people, influencing their, their decisions um, in their lives, in their professional and personal lives. Um, and so we've done a lot of workshops, uh, a lot of talks like this, a lot of roundtables, and that's sort of been the how this book came together, was really finding all these different people doing the work being excited to learn more about it, uh, being excited to collaborate with, the, uh, with them and help lift their voices. And that's, that's how the volume was born. And one thing when people came to our installations, they were always um, asking us, they're like, this is so cool, I wanna do this, I wanna do this, but I don't really know how to do it. I don't know how to get started. So we conceptualized the book um, too, for all of these folks that we had met um, you know, through our sessions, and they were actually in the work. So we asked them to write about their their amazing work and how they got started and how they started doing it to sort of give people a blueprint or several blueprints, 14 chapters, 14 blueprints to choose from, um, and three of which you'll hear about today. And and so that they could their work could live on in these different kinds of digital spaces and, and alternative um, spaces. So with that, um, we want you to hear a little bit more um, about their work, and we'll talk a little bit more about our work in the context of the roundtable. But I would like to, to, to now introduce um, the other three members of the, 
of the panel today. We have Harry, um, Harry. <laughs> Harry is not with us today. <laughs> Carrie Hawk Lassard. Pardon me, Carrie. Carrie Hawk Lassard is an applied medical anthropologist working in the field of urban Indian health. Her work focuses on focuses on historical trauma and creating culturally grounded health programs that promote healing. She is a descendant of Irish, Assiniboine, and Shawnee peoples. Greg Deal from the Pyramid Lake um, Paiute tribe um, is a provocative contemporary artist who challenges Western perceptions of indigenous people, touching on issues of race, history, and stereotypes. Through his work, Deal critically examines issues and tells stories of decolonization and appropriation that affect Indian country. And Scott Wilson is a cultural anthropologist who teaches courses on visual anthropology, new media, and identity theory at, at Cal California State University, Long Beach. His current um, project explores the relationship between space and emotion and the techniques of immersion in virtual reality experiences and non-linear documentaries. So we're very fortunate um, to have been working with these folks for a while and to have you all here tonight. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I think that we're gonna kick straight off um, with our first question for the panel. You tell us about <laughs> Yeah, our first question, um, we're keeping it very broad and, uh, and hopefully you all will have questions for us that are more specific, but we just wanna give you a, a general overview of our of our thinking around this work. So we're just going to ask, uh, what do you bring to anthropology or the academy? Maybe thinking about your perspective, your training, the different modalities. What is it that you bring to the academy? Perhaps we're going to kick off with Carrie. Okay, well, Hami Dakiapi, Kerry Haklasar de Machiapi. Um, I wanted to greet you in the language of one of my ancestors, Clark Gregg, spelled the same way as Greg Deal's first name, who is a graduate of the Carlisle uh, Indian School. And um, I didn't realize it at the time that I started uh, in my anthropological coursework, but um, that legacy within my family uh, really has proven to be very important in the work that I've chosen to do. Um, so I like to say that I'm a horrible anthropologist because I don't like to write and I don't like to present often. Um, and I think that's because the kinds of things that I'm interested in talking about um, I want to make sure are available to the people in first my urban native community, but then to urban native communities and Indian country at large. And um, anthropology in the traditional way that it's practiced by presenting at conferences and writing and, and really just writing for other anthropologists didn't seem to really do that. So in everything that I do, I try to make sure that I am using the skills that I have as an anthropologist, especially a medical anthropologist, and conveying them in a way that anyone in my community uh, can understand and, and uh, can, can relate to. So I think just being focused on the people that I actually live with um, and share space with um, and, and being mindful of them is something that I bring to the table. Thank you, Carrie. Um, and, you know, for the record, you, you write very well, even though you don't like it. So, um, <laughs> Greg, um, I think you're up next. How's your internet connection? Can you share with us a little I bit? Yeah, it's better. I think I came in uh, a little bit, uh, a little bit later, but um, I apologize. What what question are we on? We're on the um, the first question. What do you bring to, to anthropology or to the academy? Like your relationship with anthropology in terms of your perspective and training and the modalities that you use? Oh, gosh, I don't I don't know. My relationship is sort of based on um, Carrie enabling me. Uh, I don't. Um, I mean, we we bounce a lot of things off of each other and we go back and forth. And um, I think the vernacular that sort of exists um, is also something I use within my work um, and therefore sort of translates across. Um, but wouldn't wouldn't consider myself to be an anthropologist, um, more of, uh, I suppose, a, a disruptor of spaces. And um, that allows me to uh, work with with, you know, individuals like Carrie to really sort of. Um, 
figure out ways to articulate these discussions uh, that are different and that might even challenge um, perceptions. But I think that's about all I have uh, where I'm coming from on that. <laughs> All right, thank you. I'm, I'm sure we'll hear a little bit more about the partnership and how that kind of evolved and, and the bouncing off um, in a little bit. But perhaps, um, Scott, you can jump in with your, your what you bring to anthropology in terms of the modalities you use, respective training. OK, um, yeah, I, I didn't prepare a whole lot for that. What do I bring? Um, but what I could think of, I think the most important thing <clears throat> that I contribute to anthropology. I call it in my classes and it, it's not being self-deprecating, but I call it being a weasel. <laughs> Why would I put it that way? Um, this is in my chapter in the book, but it's about how to make yourself useful and survive across different deans when you're trying to do crazy stuff with new technology. Um, and part of that is finding niches within the university to do things. And so I think what I bring to the discipline of anthropology is um, just allowing for students to experiment and take risks, uh, because I think that's the best way to evolve. I learn things every year um, from working with students. I learn new techniques, I learn new technologies, I learn, um, we experiment with a lot of things. Sometimes we fall flat on our faces. And so, but as long as you can create uh, this kind of um, safety net, uh, which is, hey, look at all these cool things we do for the university. It's kind of like a service angle. As long as you do those things, and that's what allows us to do the crazy stuff. Um, I would say our record is about 50-50. 50% um, of our projects completely fail. And I let them know at the beginning of the semester that their grade is not dependent on that. And so they just kind of go for it. And so uh, what that allows us to do, what I refer to as the crazy stuff, is the XR experimentation. Uh, we've done multi-sensory um, installations like Christina and Victoria, like um, probably different, but same principle. Um, uh, we do things like that. We do uh, virtual reality simulations. Uh, we're moving into interactive virtual reality, which is kind of a, a deeper, steeper learning curve for all of us. But uh, so I just think, um, I like to think that I'm an agent of change, but I'm not sure about the direction yet. <laughs> so uh, for me, it's all just about the journey of you know, uh, trying new things. And so I uh, write about a little bit of it in the chapter for the book. Um, we've done other things too. Um, and the last thing I'll, I'll add to it is that uh, I bring new kinds of collaboration to anthropology, I think, uh, working with artists, reaching out to designers, uh, I've discovered in my work that, you know, like design departments are, uh, they make pretty things, but they don't have much content. So we have, we as anthropologists, you know, we're always simulating worlds for people, right? Through words or pictures or films or, or things like that. And so whenever we can collaborate with designers, with artists, um, they can take our content and help us create pretty things that have value and meaning in academia um and pre can present all the amazing things that we collect as ethnographers right so um so yeah i'll just leave it at that new kinds of collaboration and um just i've been working on avenues of, of allowing creating institutional avenues for creativity right among students and also among faculty i've had my hand in rewriting some tenure documents to some tenure policies in the department too so, so i'll leave it at that thank you All right, thanks so much, Scott. And I think Victoria is going to take a little stab at the the opening question, and then we'll kind of dig a little deeper. I'm first want to say I'm huge fans of of everyone's work, um, and getting to know it through this volume and through our relationships has been really inspiring to me um, as an artist and an activist and a contributor to the academy. Um, I have a fraught relationship with the academy, really. I'm what's called a non-traditional professional, meaning that I dropped out of college and taught myself some things and got a job. Um, I also dropped out of high school. So I really haven't been uh, in a great relationship with, with school my whole life. So it's interesting to be in this space over the last 10 or 15 years, um, learning 
from from graduate students and from from different academics as I go to different conferences um, and inform myself, um, sort of a, a self led learning process. So I bring that I bring a very different perspective to learning and a very different perspective to teaching as a result um, to the academy. Um, I think that that's really where my imperative to break down the walls of the ivory tower comes from because people like me need access to this information because it really informs my work in the technology sector and informs my work as a community organizer and activist and those become feedback loops like through my personal uh journey it has really become a, a feedback loop um this knowledge and my activism and the storytelling so i think that that's something that's unique to me in this space. Um, I think I bring my, my creativity, my, my, uh, my vision, <laughs> uh, and then like really practical things, like working with uh, academics who really pigeonhole themselves and do a lot of writing and a lot of talking and reading, um, but not much beyond that. So I bring like project management skills. Uh, <laughs> I bring community organizing skills, uh, technical skills like coding, um, design skills, um, and I really, this is outsider understanding that ethnography and ethnographers get at the truth in better ways than people in other disciplines and in other professions. And and really, the the desire to to lift those voices, not the ethnographers' voices necessarily, but the community voices that the ethnographers have relationships relationships to. So my deep understanding of that, I think, is something that that I bring to the Academy. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, it's something that that you helped me bring um, to the Academy. So um, this is an interesting question um, for me, because I feel like my collaboration with co-anthropology is I bring Victoria to, to anthropology. <laughs> Um, and that's what I do. So um, I think that, you know, we've been talking a lot lately at our, I, I work at a very innovative institution where we do a lot of creative work with students and experiential learning. And and, do, and we talk a lot about those kinds of ways of, of teaching students. And, and I think a lot of that maps on to teaching the public. But when it comes to it, down to it, my work with co-anthropology and public scholarship still, find it's very hard to fit it somewhere right so i think that digital humanities institutes all over the country and the world are probably kind of thinking about this right so how does this sort of digital work you know or this this sort of innovative work however we define innovative right sort of you know using installations using art using how does that kind of fit within this this these rigid academy um buckets right is it, is it teaching well yes it's teaching but it's not you know evaluated by classroom observation you know is it service well yes it's service to the discipline i think we do a great service um all public scholars to anthropology but it's not sitting on a committee right is it scholarship well yes it's based on on real research right research that that everybody has expressed is 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 critical research research that's the knowledge that needs to get out there but it's not an academic paper, right, published in a peer reviewed journal. So I think what I bring to the discipline is pushing against these buckets and saying that, you know, this this work is not only um, cool and, and interesting to do, right, but something that we write about in the preface is that this is like an imperative. Um, this helps us do anthropology better when we're thinking about who is going to receive this, this research, who is going to co-create this research with us. It helps us be better anthropologists. So I think I I remind anthropologists. I like to think that I remind um, you know folks at my institution or you know anthropology departments in general that that um, if we're really talking about changing you know the the you know reckoning with our the history of our discipline right Re reckoning with this colonial structure that we perpetuate both in the discipline and in 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 the academy in general if we really are reckoning with that, then we this this is an imperative. It's an imperative to think critically about who is um, um, receiving your work, right? And we know that it being in the digital space allows it to expand, right? We know that having embodied experiences, whether they're digital or or analog, you know, makes people remember. It changes maybe the way people think. So I also um, I think that 
you know, folks need to feel like they, I think this volume grew out of people wanting to do this work, but not really understanding how to make it fit within an academic career. So I think I, I bring that practical side as well. Like I have an academic career, I'm a tenured professor in an old institution that's been around for a long time. So I think like figuring out how to, to fit this in and make it, um, make it the imperative that I really believe it is, I think is something. So, um, <laughs> uh, um, we definitely want to hear more about um, Carrie and Greg's partnership and the actual kind of meat of the of the work a little bit more. So maybe we can kind of move on to the next question, Carrie. And um, and you and Greg might want to answer this kind of in tandem, or you know we can go around you and then Greg. But um, but how you define public scholarship? So who is your target audience? And you did talk about a little bit that in your introduction um, with with Indian country. But I know that a lot of your work speaks to a, a wider audience. So and how do you get that engagement? How do you measure that engagement? And who are your community partners um, in terms of 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 making this work happen? Sure. Well, I don't know how to tell a succinct story. So I'll start with saying that when I was a baby anthropologist, someone trusted me to do work within a Haitian American community. I had an interest in uh, HIV prevention and HIV treatment. And by becoming a part of this community, I realized how important culture is in what people believe about health, the type of health care that they will engage in, and the type of prevention activities that they'll engage in. And so when I came home um, to work in my own community, I applied that lens. Um, so, you know, I work in uh, the native community in Baltimore that really has for a long time struggled with pretty significant substance abuse. And we know uh, about HIV, one of the risk factors can be substance abuse and commercial sex work and, and just not having the right information. So when talking with people in my community, what I learned from them is that they acknowledged that these things were a problem. And the reason that they felt them to be a problem is because they felt unseen and invisible as Native people in Baltimore. Uh, many of the people in my community are members of the Lumbee tribe, so they read as either um, Black or, you know, ambiguously ethnic, but not as the Native people that they are. Um, and they also felt that other, that there was a lot of uh, lateral violence directed towards them from uh, other tribes. And so with that in mind, um, I really wanted to interrogate it, sort of the role that culture and history can play in a person's ability to have wellness. Um, I, I, I'm not an archaeologist um, by any means, but I was reading the works of Quetzal Castaneda and um, Shanks and Tilly about museumization and you know the way that we. Um, it, you know, stereotype people and, and render them into not real human beings. And I could write all of this wonderful stuff about things that I cared about, but nobody was going to read it. And I even found that, you know, from the academy saying that, you know, they wanted to hear the indigenous perspective, but at the same time, I had professors that would talk about work with their Indians. And so I didn't feel very uh, valued. Um, that's sort of where um, my uh, friendship, partnership engagement with Greg came in because Greg was creating art around the same types of, of ideas that I was writing about. I connecting them, I, I think more specifically towards health and, and wellness, but, but Greg doing the same thing. And we realized that if we could work together around these issues, people would engage with his art so like he is my secret anthropological weapon i would say and gray i don't know how you'd like to add to that or if you will accept that designation yeah i accept it i yeah i think that there's such a um i guess uh, anti-authoritative aspect to what i do that um it becomes really easy for me to ask questions or to to sort of um, buck the 
Well, the, the perception of indigenous experiences and reality, um, you know, and much like the way that Carrie's talking about professors that are talking about their Indians, there's, there's this sense of ownership. Um, and, and I reject that. Um, I reject it in my work. I reject it in my practices. And, um, and so being able to challenge those perceptions isn't just, you know, a matter of, of sort of being anti-authoritative, but also, um, uh, I think, a, a matter of survival and uh, figuring out ways to articulate an Indigenous experience that isn't informed by an uh, outside perception that is informed by essentially stereotype, by, by significant amount of years of, of uh, systemic stereotype and racism. And, um, and so I'm moving freely. I think I'm, Carrie can, you know, maybe I'm wrong or right, but I'm kind of moving freely. And I think that becomes attractive when you're dealing with a set of ideals that are um, pretty rigid in terms of like how you speak to native people, how you discuss native people, how you perceive native people. Um, and that's not just in anthropology. I mean, that's everywhere. So that means that what I'm doing just in my regular practice can also exist in other spaces because that um, that rigid perception is real everywhere. And I, I would just add to what you said, Greg, um, Leanne Brewsthead is um, a citizen of the Crow Nation and works for the Indian Health Service. And she said something once that really has always stuck with me just uh, really challenging SAMHSA and other organizations that, you know, to say they want to fund Native people. And, you know, she reminded them that what is sustainable and replicable in, in our communities um, are the traditions that, that have existed for us for um, hundreds of years, intergenerationally. And so for organizations like SAMHSA or any other type of grant making institutions who want to force Native people to really fit in a Western box, um, not only limits the opportunities that we have access to, but it doesn't fit um, our people and our priorities at all. So I think in the work that Greg and I have done, it, it's really kind of turning things on its head and taking, um, retaking ownership of indigenous science, um, you know, changing anthropology from sort of what I look at as kind of the ultimate like colonial man's club um, and, and giving, giving the voice um, to indigenous people that are painted in a very one dimensional way and allowing us to speak for ourselves, whatever our experiences may be. Thank you both. And I do have, um, you know, after this round, we have some, some images to show. So maybe you can talk more specifically about some of the projects that we were looking at um, some of those images. So, um, Scott, would you like to to chime in and, and tell us a little bit more about how you define public scholarship and your community partnerships and your target audiences, how you get that, that engagement? All right. Yeah, um, no problem. I, I, I've done a lot of smaller projects, but I will talk about the one larger one uh, that does involve a community partnership, and that's with the Tongva Gabriel Indio tribe in the Southern California, um, in the Long Beach area, Los Angeles. Um, part of uh, the VR film that I talk about in the article, and that's on the, the Cool Anthropology website, there's a link to it, um, came about, it's about the, the founding, uh, it's about the origin story of Pavuna, uh, which is a sacred site that's on camp that's part of the camp that's on part of the campus of cal state long beach and so there was a faculty member cindy alvitre who's um in american indian studies and i've known her for years and we've always talked about talked about collaborating um but uh, only when you know we started to get into vr did i have a more concrete idea of something that we could do and and we produced this film, this animated uh, 3D artwork based uh, VR simulation that combines her narration uh, with the animation and the camera flies through and things like that. But uh, that partnership came about 
because in my own work is I'm, a, I'm not trained as an applied anthropologist, but I'm in a department with several applied anthropologists. And um, as years go, have gone by, I just get, got more and more uncomfortable with some of the, the practices in visual anthropology about basically uh, people do the research and they go out and they make their film and then the film, you know, I noticed that some of my colleagues in anthropology and especially some of the classic anthropological films, it's more about the anthropologist telling their story. Um, it's about, hey, I'm going to demonstrate this theoretical principle or I'm going to show this example of this phenomenon that no one's familiar with. Um, and that's, you know, and they're thinking about what contribution they can make to anthropology. And so as I started to develop my interest in XR, and production, you know, I became, I have an article that I published about this like 10 years ago, even um, about interventions, about crafting stories alongside the communities and not even in terms of things that are, that may not, even about things that may not even be interested, interesting to other anthropologists. And so uh, I like to make things that the community finds useful, even if it's not anthropologically in interesting. And so this VR film, uh, I call them, um, uh, lateral interventions rather than vertical interventions. So it's something about, okay, so what can we collaborate? We have the technology, we've got some ideas, but we want to hear what, what can we make? What thing can we make that's useful for your community? Like it, whether it's drawing in more tourists, uh, which is what we did with some of the Chinese groups, uh, the Chinese minority students that we do. We have a field school program uh, where we take students to, uh, <laughs> to Wuhan, China, actually, <laughs> ironically enough. Um, that, you know, that's on hold, obviously, but every summer we'd go work with minority Chinese, um, average, or, um, uh, national minority Chinese students about their home communities in the mountains in China. And same thing, we want to make films, but what kind of films can help you? What are your community goals and how can we make films that help you do these things? And so with the Povona project, they wanted to create something that could be used as part of the university's orientation program for students about that part of campus, about what they can do, what they shouldn't do, um, just kind of protocols about respecting the territory and knowing where they are. And so this VR film is actually going to be part of uh, the university's uh, incoming orientation for, for first year students. Uh, and so that's what the community wanted, you know, that was, you know, they, they, they said that they're tired, they were tired of explaining these things to people as they, to not only students, but also faculty, um, because, oh, hey, you know, faculty departments will, would come up to them and say, hey, we'd like to, you know, can we have our graduation banquet? And they're like, no, not right here, not in this spot, right? And so, um, and that's the way I approach it. I approach every project that way. What does the community want? What kinds of stories can we tell uh, that can be of use to them? And so to me, that's what public anthropology is about. For me, I know there are other avenues for that too, but for me, that's what, um, and actually that VR film has actually expanded to include an interactive documentary uh, where we're taking some archival materials. We've uh, tracked down and interviewed, not tracked down, but <laughs> we've interviewed, I think, eight or nine community elders all over the Southwest, uh, from Arizona, uh, Southern California, LA. Um, I think one was in Arizona, one was in Utah. And so we actually got some funding to, um, to interview these people. Some of them are in ill health, which is why we had to travel to them. And so the community wants, you know, we've made an interview based documentary, but we're gonna supplement that with interactive elements like archival photographs, photographs and maps of uh, the original waterways that were really important to the people there. And so it's really, you know, in my case, it's really community led. Um, it's whatever kinds of things they, and, you know, at the same time, it's also anthropologically interesting. You know, it's um, it, the, the interactive website will be something that will grow. Um, we've already got plans for how we can add to it constantly. So it would be, it's a flexible, you know, it's one of the things that new media allows is that you can constantly update things. And so we've got all the interviews, we've, um, uh, we've got the maps and the photographs and we've collected um, all of these things from the community. They wanted their own archive. So the film itself will be an archive for community, uh, for community documents and things. So, um, so yeah, I, I think it's been really productive um, we're just finishing that. I think it will be done in about May. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's grown organically. Uh, they sought me out actually, um, because of the VR projects. So 
Um, I like it. I, I love it when it grows organically like that. They saw the v, the VR project was really popular. It was, a, it was a pretty big hit on campus in the theater uh, right before the pandemic hit. Uh, but then they sought me out to do more, and we got funding from from a source on campus from COVID. Um, our dean put, wanted to put money into an anti-racism project, and a lot of other departments didn't have any ideas, and so we kind of created this one. So um, yeah, for me, I like I said, I'm not trained as an as an applied anthropologist, but I'm surrounded by them in my department, and so I've been influenced heavily by making things that are useful for them. I've been much more. I think what we do is much more useful for communities around and for training students than it is for um that it is contributing to like larger discourses in the discipline if anything although we do, i think we do have a lot to say which you know i tend to ramble so like i may say a lot to say about it but i'll stop there but yeah that's that would be my answer for community partnerships like what do they find useful and what what are their goals and try to create things with them that can that can do that simply put i guess Thank you, Scott. Yeah, I, I agreed. And I definitely think your work speaks to anthropology in a wider sense as well. There's lots of analysis, I think. And um, anyway, but Victoria, <laughs> how do you um, define public scholarship from your perspective? I'm going to piggyback off of, of what everyone's been saying. I think that the, the co-creation and co-production of knowledge really speaks to um, public scholarship. I think like what anthropology brings is a, or what the academy brings in general is like a rigor in research methods and a trustability um, when you're talking to, to a lot of different sorts of communities. But I think that what uh, anthropologists and academics fail to do is, is actually meet people where they actually are. And that doesn't just mean in terms of space and proximity, but in terms of language, in terms of the different modalities that might um, hit home for different communities. Um, so for me, public scholarship is really thinking of, thinking through the rigor and thinking through the research frameworks and then meeting people where they are, wherever they are, at whatever level of understanding or, or interest that they have. And that's sort of the broad umbrella that I think about public, uh, public scholarship in general. And I think what, what makes it public uh, is, is thinking about decolonizing the success metrics, you know, like where things get published how many clicks or attendees or how much funding and who's funding, like really not thinking about that as much. Although it is important because you have to get your work out and you have to eat um, <laughs> and you want um, help and assistance in, in, in getting your work out there in various ways, like the University of Toronto Press and in relation to this book has been incredibly helpful um, and supportive of the work. Um, but it's really thinking beyond that, you know, like I prefer more qualitative like intangible effects of my work more generational effects of my work um and just thinking like we have a small crowd here and if if you all go off and are inspired by what you hear to do a project and it has an impact in whatever communities that to me is more important than if ten thousand people see something i've created and i think that that's something that we bring to public anthropology and public scholarship. And it's how I think about it. I really want to move away from these very corporate and, and academic structures that, that think about success and access in a very specific framework and really thinking more generationally. Maybe you can pick up on that and I can add more. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, I do think about, um, I'm always, thinking about success metrics that Victoria mentioned and like what it means to, um, you know, at the university, we, we think about, you know, scholarship is number of, of citations or number of readers. We also think about like student success in terms of graduation rates, you know, and one of my most favorite students didn't graduate at all. Um, but I still feel like, you know, his involvement in some of Cool Anthropology's project was very successful. Um, it's successful in his life, what anthropology has brought to him. So I think about public scholarship as sort of measuring, um, you know, changing individual conversations and, and changing, and you change so many individual conversations that you begin to change the culture, um, the culture of academia, the culture at large, right? Um, so I don't know, thinking about like who my communities are, this is something that we talk about a lot in the volume is like, who are your communities? Who are your publics? 
Um, and I just like, it's everybody, you know, I want everybody. <laughs> but like, when you think about it, like where, from my positionality, who can I really touch? And I think a lot of times I teach a lot of students who are not going to go on to be anthropologists, but just, um, and that I, to me is a form of public scholarship, right? So, you know, having innovative um, teaching tools in the form of digital materials and, and, and artistic contributions make students feel a certain way that they remember um, like the anthropological methods and toolkits that that, that all kind of came with, right? If you think about that. So I think that that's something that I, I really have been defining public scholarship more and more when I think about students who are not, um, thank, thank you, Denise. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for, for checking in. Check the recording. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so I've been thinking about that more and more, you know, students um, and also, you know, changing the way other anthropologists even think or other scholars think about, you know, they, they are public um, and, and how to define it, define it. So um, I think a nice anecdote might be you had a, an experience in your public health class with someone who worked for the city. That might be a really nice example of what you're talking about. Certainly me as a technologist and as a professional in the tech sector, like um, all of my anthropological knowledge and, and understandings and, and the different experiences I've had with different communities around the world through the work that we've done has really impacted how I, how I interact and the decisions that I make and how I build community around the work. So I, I, Christina has a great example of, of the influence, like these sort of intangible things that, that we can uh, seek to measure. And yeah. So, you know, I don't work with a lot of applied anthropologists, but I work with, um, unlike Scott, but I work with a lot of innovative anthropologists, but I was trained in an in applied program. And um, so I teach a doctoral class in public health as an example that Victoria was talking about with students. Um, one of my students um, during the class um, got a position, a very high level position in the New York City Department of Health and, and um, Hygiene here in New York. And she was the, the chief of staff to the, the health commissioner. And um, we had we had read an article where we talked about the power of language and philanthropology has a, a project about language that Greg and Carrie have participated in. And I we read an article about how, um, you know, how how much of an impact language can have when you're talking about community partnerships and community participation in different projects. And so what she did is she she noticed that all the memos coming across her desk about different um, health programming in, in New York said recipients. Of different program and she said well perhaps we could change recipients to participants right to kind of reflect um, rather than a top-down approach of receiving but a communication and a participation and the health commissioner agreed and so all of the documents in the new york city um, department of health and hygiene were changed to participants from recipients and it seemed like a, that to me was a very valuable moment where sort of applied um, anthropology kind of became you know noticeable to the public and so that, that's something that i think about is like those little moments where you can take the the anthropological analysis and sort of apply it in various kinds of ways and um, really make a substantial impact right the new york city department of health is pretty massive yeah, a lot of paperwork going, <laughs> going going around there so i think it's cool to do that in the classroom as an educator but as artists and storytellers like we're making the space and we're popping up in community centers and uh, uh in parks and community gardens and various other spaces and who knows what people are doing with that information when they leave we can't measure it mm -hmm. and i think that that example within the classroom is really salient because the, those are the sorts of connections we're really seeking to make. Um, putting that information out there in a, in a way that's palatable to whatever space you happen to be in, and then, you know, hoping that conversations and decision making changes as a result of that. Thank you. So I know that we have a lot more conversation to have. Um, I was hoping um, to show a few images just because a lot of our work is visual, all of our work is visual um, and it exists across different kinds of spaces. Um, so um, if with everybody's permission, Scott and Carrie and Greg, 
Um, maybe I'll share my screen and just share a few images and maybe we can kind of talk through the images and, and perhaps at the same time open up the floor um, for questions. I know Denise had to leave, but there's others in the room. If you if you would like to sort of, um, you know, any questions that arise from the images or from what you've heard of our conversation so far, please um, feel free to, to chime in in the chat or we can um, also, um, you know, you can unmute and let's make this more discussed. There's such a, there's a small group. All right, so first up, um, we have some images um, that are in the book and also from one of the cool anthropology installations from, from Carrie and Greg. Um, this is their chapter title. This is loading for me. Let me know, can, can we see it? Yes, okay. All right, so the two, I mean, I can let you know, Carrie and Greg can take it from here. Yes, um, so I can, um, you know, have Greg speak about the blood painting and the sticker and the uh, the last American Indian on Earth. Um, I was involved with blood painting, um, but I will talk a little bit about um, the image in the center where Greg is kind of surrounded with people who are mocking him. Um, one of the issues and, and sort of how we connected, um, we were both active in the change where we live um, or advocating for the change of the DC football team's name and its logo. And, you know, just considering the aspect of ownership that Greg talked about before and how, um, it, Native people, I, it, it's interesting, a couple of things will happen, you know, if a Native person will say that, you know, they object to this image, then the kind of first line of defense is to invalidate that person's identity as a Native person. So it's, you know, I have the authority to tell you who you are, not your tribe, not your family, uh, me as a person who loves this football team. The second thing is that it was very apparent that um, the right to have and support this team became more important than um, the opinions of the people that this team and, and its image purportedly depict. So um, one of the things that I did was kind of go through um, any comment section uh, on the Washington Post or the Washington DC city paper that was about the issue and pull those things out, the, the things that people say, the really invalidating things that people say, and those um, were uh, words that are put onto this painting that Greg can speak about, but also they were the words said by the um, actors who were taunting Greg. And Greg, do you wanna speak about um, art all night and just contextualize that, that image for folks? Sure. Um, so it's a perform. The the piece was called Redskin. It was perf it was a performance piece. It was done uh, one night for um, several several hours, um, and the premise of it was uh, a, a sort of site specific um, installation piece. It had a number of different elements to it, um, and then the night in question uh, was for the performance piece itself. And in the performance piece. Um, I essentially was the Indian in the room, if you will, um, sitting in the middle of this room uh, where four antagonizers uh, from varying uh, places, uh, different genders, different ethnicities, um, were essentially talking to me in the same language that is used in those comment sections that uh, Carrie mentioned before. And um, the, the entire thing was just sort of to illustrate how um, non-micro these aggressions are and uh and to really also just like shine a light on how incredibly problematic those things are um i mean that's the long and short of it and then the blood painting do you want to unpack that yeah yeah so sort of in that same time and place i mean and at this point you know um these works are also, I believe, like seven years old, um, thereabouts. And uh, that piece was um, taking that, that same language 
um, placing it onto a painting with the uh, the Washington football team's um, logo. Uh, I actually um, cut myself, and and so there's blood in uh, in the painting, uh, specifically in the the logo figure face, the profile picture. Um, and there's a 24 karat gold uh, gold leaf, and um, just a lot of sort of layers and moving parts attached to that. Uh, and this piece was actually acquired by the Denver Art Museum uh, in Denver, Colorado as well. Um, it, it, there's a lot of symbolism to it. I'm sure you guys can draw conclusions to what that symbolism is. Um, and it was uh, sort of in kind of at the, the heat, or the, the peak of the mascot debate when natives were involved in it. And, um, and social media was actually playing a big part in that. Um, not to confuse it with the um, moment that everything changed last year, uh, which I, which I think was um, wholeheartedly informed by Black Lives Matter. So, um, so that was like 2014, I believe, is when that was sort of happening. Yes, and and then the the other images that you see. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking of is is just the ways in which we work together. Um, Anthropology, for as much as it likes to see itself as kind of a translational science, um, I think that the people that it purports to reach sometimes, even in applied anthropology, the language and the jargon that we use is so obfuscatory, and see there, I just did it, um, that the people in my community may not know what I am speaking about unless I use plain language. And so uh, one of the uh, writers that we both uh, really love, Vine Deloria Jr., who is a Dakota, um, he wrote uh, Custer Died for Your Sins, but he spoke or wrote about a very specific um, uh, uh, something that happened uh, once upon a time called um, the Indigenous Zoo. Um, is that, is it the indigenous, no, ethnographic zoo, sorry, the ethnographic zoo, um, where they put, I, I don't know if it was Inuit or some other type of Alaskan tribal member, but was literally on display in a museum, um, kind of like Ishi, and, and that the native person was, again, a curiosity and not a real human being with, you know, their own desires and wants and needs, um, and so kind of built off Greg's earlier work, um, during the last American Indian on Earth, where I was writing about the way that stereotype harms actual Native people, not only in the way that others interact with them, but the way that they see themselves and the way that they, they see their possibilities. Um, so Greg, maybe you can talk about the way that um, last American Indian on Earth and ethnographic zoo um, tie together and you know use your performance art, but also have those like credible anthropological concepts sort of embedded in them. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, it has to also be said, you know, ethnographic zoos, you know, became sort of a standard um, of the white gaze at a time when privileges didn't weren't allotted to, to brown people. Um, so it was at world fairs, um, it was at actual zoos, um, you know, any way that any way that could be could be found, uh, you know, these sort of standards and practices, which are which are sort of swept under the rug. But if you look hard enough, you could find some significant evidence um, that these things existed. And so um, the last American Indian on Earth and the ethnographic zoo piece um, are, are really capitalizing on the white gaze and and the reaction and the sort of. Um, uh, interaction of uh, non-native folks uh, using that white gaze, not only in terms of how it informs what they're looking at, but also informs the way that, that they're interacting with me. And um, so I was able to sort of record and document um, the sort of dehumanizing actions that are normalized under the limited concept that people have of indigenous existence at all. Um, that that we're not you know human beings to be talked to, but a thing uh, to take pictures with, and uh, you know, no better than really uh, um, you know Mickey Mouse costume at, at Disneyland. 
And, um, but those things were really capitalizing on things that already exist in plain sight, um, but illustrating them and, you know, maybe a little, little hyperbolic as well, but, but really shining a light on how difficult it is as a native person uh, to navigate these spaces. And while it might be hyper-realized in some of this work, um, any native person will hear in their lifetime uh, the number of things that I heard, uh, you know, during each of these performances. Um, and so it really ends up becoming less about being indigenous and more about the environment in which indigenous bodies exist and, uh, and what that difficulty looks like. And that difficulty, it has to also be said that um, that difficulty is often something that is dismissed as not being real or true. And in this day of age, you know, in terms of documentation and the ease of documentation, um, it became really easy to be able to uh, shine a light on those things and to sort of even to the degree of exploiting it um, to show that, that, you know, we're not a uh, soft hearted, sensitive people that there's some pretty serious shit going on out there. Greg, may I ask you um, just to contextualize the two images? So did you ask people to take pictures with you? Like, or, or, were, or were you the installation and people just came up and started taking pictures with you? No, um, so the last American Indian on earth, um, no, at no point did I ever ask anybody to take pictures of me. Okay, so the so, image at the top. Yeah, so the, is the last Native American on earth, that's bottom right? In the screen? Uh, it's, the, it's, it's the top one with the family sitting around me. Oh, okay, okay, pardon me for interrupting you. So yeah. um, that, is, that is a family that, that came to me and asked to take a picture of me. And um, the, the father who's sitting next to me um, wanted to point to his Cleveland Indians hat um, while doing it. So that's not a setup. That, that actually happened. Um, and uh, the photographer I was working with um, is also my uh, wife. And we worked together very closely on like what these pictures and things might look at. And, um, and Megan was actually able to, to grab that shot. Um, and we have video of that same moment as well. It's interesting kind of looking at the two. Um, within the last American Indian on Earth, it was not uncommon for people to like walk up and um, take selfies without ever saying a word to me. Um, but then there was also a number of people that would sort of yell racial slurs as they went by and um, or say something to my face. Um, so I was never in a position welcoming anything. I was just walking through existing in those spaces. Um, ethnographic zoo is one where I'm standing uh, with the sign on the, the lower uh, right. And um, same concept as the last American Indian on earth, except that I had stanchioned myself off um, as if to sort of be in uh, a cage space. Um, there was a little bit of tongue in cheek and it's also very different because it was done in, um, in Denver on like a day or two after Thanksgiving. Uh, the context is totally different and, and even just the context in which uh, people interact with Native people uh, is different in Washington, D.C. than it is in, in the American West because um, there are expectations that are built upon historical narratives. Uh, so like in Washington, D.C., you have a football team, you know, with a, with a dictionary defined racial slur attached to it. And so anybody could come from, from the world and this happened. Um, come, come from anywhere in the world and would is immediately call me a redskin uh, because that context was already there. And I took this piece to New York City um, and it was totally different. The, the reactions were totally different. So too were the reactions in the American West because there is an, ex, an expectation built upon narratives that um, contrived or not have already been set forth with the cowboy and Indian narrative and sort of westward expansion. Um, so, and, and even just in reference to cowboys and Indians or westward expansion, you can already see how problematic the context is. And so people react sort of according to that. Um, and that's uh, really, yeah, that's really sort of the basis of those two pieces. Where are we? Hi. So Scott is going to be back shortly. He just put in the chat. So why don't we go ahead and why, why you, you're, you're just going forward. I'm trying to go back to that slide. I just wanted to make a, okay. a quick comment. Um, what I really love about this work is that there's an experience happening in real time 
um, without any hint of irony, obviously, with a lot of the people who are participating in the project. And then there's a completely different experience as you tell the story and show the images in other spaces. And I love that there's two completely different experiences happening with the with the very same output of work. Um, it's, and Victoria, yeah. I just want to point out coming from a trauma informed perspective, you know, after the event, um, I checked in with Greg first to see how he was doing having to hear, you know, all of, of, you know, those comments made to him and endure that he was completely fine. Um, it was when I reached out to the individuals who were the antagonists that they were just gutted and felt awful the day after. So what that tells me as a medical anthropologist is the way that um, that experience of, of being dehumanized is so normalized to Native people um, that, you know, Greg was hardly phased by it, where uh, for decent people who wouldn't normally behave this way, it was very difficult for them and, and a very heavy thing for them to carry. And I'm sorry, I think I interrupted you, Greg. No, I I think it's um, I think that that's actually really important. Um, but there, I think there is an emotional labor attached to it. There's actually a reason why I don't do this type of work now um, because it's it's really exhausting. And um, and then after it being exhausting, you have to you know as I present it, as people are seeing, it, as I'm asked to sort of speak about it, um, you're reliving those moments. Um, and this is not to say that I won't use these in my practice anytime soon, but I can legitimately say that I've not done something like this, um, where there is an element of sacrifice attached to it, um, which I think is also really interesting in terms of, you know, looking at indigenous ceremony. There are elements of sacrifice attached to those things as well, but that sacrifice almost becomes uh, necessary to be able to see the true manner in which why these things sort of exist in, in uh, the American um, psyche, if not Western culture at large. And so um, these are these are difficult. Um, and Carrie's right. I'm, I was fine, you know, after we did Redskin. Um, but at, like the last American Indian on Earth, I mean, that was that was in 2013. And I'm still talking about that. And uh, and it, it gets to be a little tiresome. I mean, I'm proud of it. It's it's cool. But like there is sort of a uh, mental exhaustion that is attached to it as well, that is forever ingrained in my work. And, um, and so it will come up, it will often come up. And, and so there's aspects of that too, that I think um, are, you can't really let go of, but the normalization of uh, trauma to indigenous people is also, it's really interesting, you know, the way that Carrie says that, and we've had that conversation, um, but it's almost as though that must exist within the work in order for people to understand it as well, which I think is um, is also just sort of disturbing and problematic um, while simultaneously true. We had the, the honor of, um, of using the, the painting and the, the flyer that you see with all the different names in a project that we did called Shifting Stereotypes. And we also toured with that in different parts of the country with different uh, groups of people um, and had very different receptions and, and experiences um, with, the, with the different participants in, in the project. You know, when we're uh, at a anthropology conference with uh, mostly middle-aged white women, they had a certain uh, experience. Uh, we asked people to read quotes aloud, quotes like you, you have on that painting that you took from comment sections, but we, we actually, um, took quotes from people in power saying things like that, like superintendents or presidential candidates or police officers. We asked people to read those out loud. And, you know, the experiences at, at the conference were very different than at, uh, you know, the Urban Community College in New York City um, and, and other public spaces. So I think it's really important to say that, that these things hit differently um, with different groups of people and that informs us as storytellers and artists um, and, and informs our, our future work in, in storytelling. So, um, Scott, are you, are you back? Why don't we just, I'm gonna quickly, thank you so much, Greg, for kind of sharing this with us and Carrie um, and reliving that experience. And um, it's a, a amazing. Um, yeah, I 
Scott Steen. Scott's like, here. <laughs> he's Scott's back. Um, yeah, I'm back, but I have. I'm picking up my wife from the hospital, so I'm waiting for them to bring her. All down. right. Well, yes. maybe we can. Um, I'm so. Of course, that's more important. <laughs> um, this is. We just pulled a couple of images of, from your films for from the chapter, but maybe we'll talk a few minutes. We're coming to the end of our time, so maybe we'll talk a few minutes to um, about Kowit Grandfro's work, and then we can kind of come back. Okay. Okay, I can, uh, yeah, write things like uh, do, you, do you want us to come back to you, Scott? It's fine. We yeah, can you talk. can if you come back to me. That would okay, be, no uh, problem. Okay, okay. All right, so I wanted to, and just go ahead and mute if you can, Scott. Thank you. All right, so we w we just pulled a few images to kind of give you a sense of the kind of ways that that co anthropology has 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 done public scholarship. And Victoria mentioned our first um, installation um, way back at the beginning of this talk. Hopefully, you remember that's on the left, where we had the participants grind corn, and we had them. Um, you know, a walk through the gallery space where people had interpreted this embodied experience. And then the images lived on um, in the online space. And then on the right, you see one of our, our newest projects during COVID. We didn't do any installations, but we did have, um, we worked with a team of, of young people to develop um, an Instagram campaign around our ethnography matters, where we highlighted um, quotes from um, different ethnographers um to to kind of think about why ethnography mattered or or kind of have those sort of sound bites that you might get from an economist or a sociologist in response to something but but from an ethnographer um we should just sort of something that uh, that i'd like victoria to talk about is something called transmedia storytelling and when she was talking about greg's work and how it lives in multiple spaces um that's something that we really think about a lot with co anthropology's work and so we we start with these installations but then they move on into these digital spaces and have a digital life um so maybe we can talk a little bit more yeah transmedia storytelling is really a, a method of storytelling that has different uh spaces and modalities and you don't know where your audience is going to enter so they might enter on Instagram looking at a specific image. They may come to the installation, they may see a video on YouTube, um, but it's an entry point in a different space. And they that may be the only thing they ever see or ever read um, related to the story, or it may entice them to go deeper and see more of the project. So when we are conceptualizing our projects, we try to think about where it might live in different spaces. We really wanna think about the efficacy of our work and our time and we want um we want it to be useful you know we spend a lot of time we work with a lot of great artists and a lot of community members and other scholars and we we don't generally have a whole lot of funding to to compensate them so we really want the, the work to to be out there and to be used and to be useful so we think about the different variables that might make up a larger equation of our project and and think about how they might be used in online in social media campaigns um, in classrooms as teaching tools, and just as artwork that can be um, on the wall of of of, our, of of someone's of a teenager's bedroom, like if we're looking at some of, some of these cartoonish icons on the bottom, we really try to think about like the different spaces they might live and the different entry points to the to the knowledge that we're trying to present. I do think that's Carrie right here. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> Probably um, because it's Dr. Harris, so I would imagine. <laughs> so it's it's cute you still call him Dr. Harris. Just you know, just to know that Carrie and I met in Dr. Harris's medical anthropology class in 1994, and there's him checking out the our installation. So you can see this in the digital space on Cool Anthropology's website. Oh, just to go back really quickly, okay. um, and you can see how much how much actual stuff is at this installation, all these different frames with, with tablets inserted in them, all these different um, uh, activities on the tables, all the different um, infographics. And we travel with those across the country and to different spaces. And we, it's, it's just a lot of actual labor. So we really think about how these different components might get to live anywhere and we don't have to, to take them there physically. 
Um, and these are just some images of the different parts of the shifting stereotype. So you saw um, Greg's work and Carrie also contributed to, to um, some of the posters. Um, Victoria described how people were reading the quotes and then um, the anthro hack that you see at the bottom right is, um, is something that we conceived of. It's a, it was a hackathon between social scientists and computer scientists to develop a, a tool where people in the digital space could do pile sorting. Um, and they were pile sorting at our second installation terms that, that were related to the stereotyping experience and stereotypes. And we wanted that to be to exist in the digital space without us being there to do the installation. And so that um, that led us to have this hackathon where we developed this tool. So you can use it in your research. You can use it in your digital. Yeah. And as, as you can see, the, the previous installation had all those different physical components and these are posters. So as we've moved through our our conceptualization of our projects. We wanted to that them to be more and more open access and open source. So as part of this project, you can download these posters, you can print them out. The, the plugin that we made is open source, anyone can use it. Um, and that's something that we really think about is just like, how can these be used if when we're not there? I can't say that enough. <laughs> so that just gives you a little taste. Um, we wanted to kind of just just um, focus in on the questions that the contributors, so Carrie and Greg have a chapter, Scott has a chapter, and we asked all of our contributors to answer these questions in the chapters. So if you're interested in sort of taking um, whatever your avenue of interest is, we're happy to answer more questions specifically about our work. I'm sure Carrie and Greg are, and also Scott. Um, but we can, you can also kind of delve into it in different modalities. We also have um, a lot of a, a digital companion and we can find all these works um, digitally as well. So I wanted to sort of open up. I don't know if um, Scott, let me know if you want to talk a little bit more. Otherwise, maybe we can sort of take some questions or are you. I can talk briefly about mine. OK, uh, good. I'll, um, I'll head back for a minute or two and then. Okay. You can come back to this slide, no problem. There you go. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Just very briefly, I know it's like wanted to open it up uh, and everything, but uh, those are my images from the book, uh, obviously. The one on the right, uh, that's Red-Legged Frog Woman and Coyote from uh, from the Pavonga project. And one of the things, like one of the things that Greg was talking about was really interesting to me, like was uh, uh, just about Part of, I heard something similar that he was talking about that came up in ours and that the communities, um, the Tongva community was really interested in showing people that they're still there. And so part of reimagining the, the space is, is kind of resisting that whole idea of museum, uh, museumization, I think the term uh, was, uh, this idea that, that, that indigenous peoples only exist in the past and that they're, they're uh, that their heritage is all in the past, but one of the, the goals of that project was to show that, that you know, they are a major influence on what's happening now in Southern California, that they're still here and that the land that you stand on, um, the land that you, you're, that we do all of these things at the university on uh, is still part of their history. And so they're trying to reconnect people with the past that they didn't know about before, um, even for people outside of the community. Um, it's also expanding into uh, a walking tour uh, because the VR film is designed to one of the effect, one of the intended effects of the film is to uh, superimpose the mythological component on top of the actual physical space and to demonstrate to people how the landscape has been altered through development in a lot of ways. And so uh, that's one of the 3D art pieces that the camera flies through uh, in the project. Uh, some of the other two, the one at the bottom bottom left is from a project about, a, it was a class project actually, the director was one of my students. Um, just a, a simulation of, a, a, it's a simulation of what the world looks like to him as a blind person. And it's not, it's a lot more complicated than people thought. And so it's a very simple project, but I thought it was a very powerful example of how uh, simulations, uh, uh, the value of simulations and ethnographic research is a very small class project, but I think they use it. They they 
the director, Jenny Cho, actually uh, did a really good job of collaborating with the student um, to produce a world, you know, to produce a subjective world. And I like to use that as an example of how with even more advanced ethnographic projects, we can recreate, we can uh, not create accurate representations. It's not about accuracy in terms of representing the world, but it's about um, recreating the world from someone else's perspective in a lot of ways. And I think it can be a very powerful contrib contribution. And then the third one, the top left is from body, the body of three, where we, um, you can read about it in the chapter um, about a burlesque performer. Uh, we, it, we went through a lot of hoops to get that one produced, but uh, um, I use it to talk about just the staging elements of VR production where a lot, you're not really documenting live events for the most part, the more powerful VR documentaries are the ones that are staged and planned and mapped out and scripted in a lot of ways. So um, I think it's, it, you know, it can work very well if you collaborate with the community members to actually script these things. And so um, it's a very different way of doing things though, again, as I mentioned earlier. So, you know, it takes a lot of institutional and disciplinary maneuvers uh, to, to get this into the ethnographic record. So I'll just leave it there. I know you wanted to open it up. I, I just very briefly about the images that I put in the book. Thanks so much, Scott. Amazing work. All right, I know we have a couple of minutes. I just wanna say thank you to all of you for, for being here until, until the end. And um, I don't know if Greg, you might wanna put your, if anybody, Scott or Carrie or Greg, but I was thinking Greg's Instagram or um, wanna put in the chat, feel free. These are some of our Cool Anthro, um, the main website will be a link to Scott's work and, and some of the work from Carrie and Greg as well as a comp as a digital companion to the book. So it's all we're all findable and um, the work is it can live on in the digital space. But um, thanks so much to all of you and to Anne and to the the UNF um, Digital Humanities Institute. Um, do we have any? Thank you, Carrie, um, in the chat. If you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. I just wanted to thank you all for sharing this this information. Um, I'm a I'm an archaeologist, but I work in the Mediterranean. So oftentimes, when people want a career in anthropology that they where they want to combine lots of interests, like all of you do, it can be very hard for me to connect people to you know, lived experiences besides just besides reading and ethnography, which I think are very important, but just to experience anthropology in a different way. And I think this is a, a great resource. I'll definitely be pointing my students to it. Thank, so, thank you. you. Thank you. I think what's cool um, about what we've all been talking about is, you know, sometimes the idea comes from our own lives and from our own experience and interests. And then often it comes from working with community members and, and things that they ask and resources that they need, uh, as Scott, is, as everyone's really talked about, and, and our projects also are reflective of. So, you know, just being open to that, like with your own activism, like your own uh, perspective, and then like really listening and, and making those deep connections with community members and, and, and helping be, being a conduit for the storytelling. Others who have questions, or do we, any of our panelists have questions for each other? It seems <laughs> like there's some synergies happening, which is always nice. We're, we're um, we just want to say that, that how honored we always are to to present on a panel with with you all. Amazing, your work is amazing, and we're to collaborate with you is is um, you know a privilege and an honor and inspires us every time to do um different work i'm i'm really grateful for the opportunity and and you know grateful to know about scott's work it was something that i mentioned to you know one of our friends uh caleb owens that we went to school with who's at cal state in long beach and an animator and I, he was trying to figure out ways that he could work within Indian country as a descendant himself. And we talked about whether or not it would be 
helpful or traumatizing for native people, especially here on the East Coast to use VR as a mechanism to look at their world pre-contact and to imagine how their ancestors might have occupied space. So I, I hope that those streams can cross in the future. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, let me know if anyone wants to work in that space. Um, we chose, we deliberately chose a, you know, more abstract art form, but there are ways of, I know that there are people working in, it actually in some ways would be easier to do things that are more photorealistic, um, to recreate spaces. And yeah, I think it'd be a combination of archaeology, oral history, um, community storytellers. I think you could really put something together uh, like that. So, you know, and, the, and it doesn't, techno, in terms of technology and, and software, it really doesn't take that much. All of this could be done with a combination of cameras and Unity. Um, the same engines that produce, that are used to create video games can be used for documentary also. Um, I, I'm starting to learn some of that stuff myself, but uh, anyone who wants to work in that, yeah, you can put them in touch with me. Um, and I can help in any way I can. And I think that even, uh, you said that they are in Southern California? Um, yes, so Caleb's a professor, uh, an assistant professor at um, Cal State um, at the Mike Curb School of blah, blah, blah. So, um, and I should have pulled, I think it was Northridge. Um, Northridge but Northridge. yeah, um, and, and Caleb is a former um, gamer, uh, you're, he created, games so an animator in his own right um and I, I know that i've tried to connect victoria and hope to still do that with uh, another native anthropologist who's in michigan working with the forest county potawatomi tribe but who i know from my days at the 9 30 club in the 80s and we thought it would be really cool to find a way that people now who say oh what a time that must have been to live in you know, is there a way to hear the oral history of, of people who were part of that punk scene back in the day and, and have it more real uh, for them? So lots of possibilities. Yeah, really I love running into you in person, Carrie, because we're always uh, generating really great ideas. And I'm excited to move forward on that one or any of them, really. I think something that we really um, have been talking about a lot and evangelizing is building the community around public scholarship and, and a support network. So much of our, so many of our authors, all of our authors noted in the volume that that's something that they were really missing. And that's something that we really seek to build on. You know, we're not the first ones to be doing it, certainly. And we've been inspired by our mentors. Um, but it's something that we really are, are, are trying very deliberately to do is build that community and that we've, you know, have so many great authors that are willing to open up their skills and their experience and, and have conversations with people coming behind us as we open the, as we open the door for ourselves and keep it open for the folks coming up behind us. I think that's one of the, the most important impacts of this work. Yes. It's cool to see Scott and Carrie have that. Yeah. That's, that's the goal. And all you future people who, who are not here right now, who might be watching this video, please reach out. And the few that are. <laughs> well, wonderful. On that note, I, I think we'll wrap it up. I, I really enjoyed tonight's talk. I appreciate all of the work that you're doing individually and collectively in, in putting this together. And I know that it'll be of interest, not just to the um, to the folks that are involved in DHI, although this overlaps with many of the themes of many of the, the research interests at our institute, but also more broadly, um, you know, undergraduate students, not unlike what Carrie and I were talking about before everyone joined is, you know, undergrads have the energy and they really want to see how anthropology uh, works, what it, what it can do. And these are really excellent examples of that. So we look forward to the book. We look forward to working with you all again. And um, we thank you very much. Thank you, Anne. Thank you, thank so, you much. so much for inviting us. And thank you, um, Scott right. and Greg and Jerry. Right. Oh, <laughs> we'll be not on call. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks again.
I didn't realize I was muted. Thanks very much. Oops, let me, Thank you. Let me stop.